Who needs an intro, right? <laughs> yeah, at this point, um, I it's mean, been hell, just just today on Twitter, just to date this shit, some guy was typing your name on Patreon and somehow my name came up. And I was just, like, wow, uh, he has thousands of videos. That says something. <laughs> just to date all this, we were, and this is how, I, I guess maybe this can explain, like, or m- maybe not explain, but sort of partly, like, give an idea as to why, like, it's been so long since you and I have gotten together to talk about stuff. This is, like, what what would you say? This is now, like, three weeks after Stephen Bochco passed away? Yes. Um, I, I, I think it was, like, maybe the day of or maybe the day after I wrote to you and said, like, hey, it's been a while since we've done this. Do you want to get together? Uh, do you want to get together here soon and maybe talk about a bunch of Stephen Bochco stuff? You're like, yeah, totally. I'm like, I'm like, OK, cool. And uh, something else happened. Well, I, I went up to, I, I think I, I went up to Albany. I had a relative in the hospital. I, who knows with me? Like, uh, Space was a year's wor- time was bendable. Dogs and cats living together. A year's worth of material usually always happens within about three weeks for me. So eventually, like, uh, if it's like, okay, uh, let's see, I'm going to, I'm going to be hanging out at the hospital with my relative a bit this weekend. I wrote to you like what four or five days ago, and was like, "Okay, let's let's lock in a date yeah. uh, Friday. Uh, there, let's go ahead and do it on Friday." Uh, and you were you just got in hell. This isn't even the only thing you recorded today. You just did a riff, didn't yeah. you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just did uh, Gregory Whiten's uh, "The Prophecy." I think both of us ended up. Uh, just go ahead and got going to because we have our shows that we instantly go to in our head whenever we think yeah. of of steven bochco um i go and, straight to hill street yeah uh hill street and nypd for me um but um obvious obviously nypd 2049 of course <laughs> but no i mean both of us ended up going like okay let's do some double checking Let, and let's, don't worry let's... guys cop rock is coming oh yeah that's that's <laughs> definitely coming up um, but it is cool even looking to see, uh, some of the stuff that he worked on right. before, even before he made a name for himself with Hill Street Blues. The dude wrote Silent Running. Directed by Douglas Trumbull, starring yeah. Bruce Dern, and three amputees playing those robots. You gotta give those motherfuckers credit. They were going through hell playing those fucking characters. And you they can tra- are characters. Yeah, you can you can trace a lot of our like humor and what a lot of us do for a living. You can kind of trace it back to Stephen Bochco a little bit because, yeah, because Silent, Silent Running, Running is the inspiration for MST3K. Exactly, Silent Running inspiration for MST3K certainly an inspiration for <laughs> a lot of us who make yeah. you know, like like me and you making obscure references all the time and a lot of the the humor that we all use on our particular websites and not only did he write silent running but you and I are old enough to remember back when Dennis Dugan was an actor yes <laughs> now Dennis Dugan for a lot of you might know him as he's he's directed most of the Adam Sandler movies. Well, uh, Gay Juice knows him as the director of one of the greatest fucking movies of all time called Brain Donors. Yeah, his best his best movie. Easily Hands fucking down. Easily his best movie. Not quite the career path he went on right. after making Brain Donors, but this guy, uh, Dennis Dugan, he starred in a what did it last? Like maybe a season or two. Uh, Richie, was it Richie? Richie Brockelman. Oh Private my God. Eye. I know that show. Remember that? Yes. Richie Brockelman. Private yes. Eye. Steven Bochco was a writer on that show before, uh, but right be- a-, a few years before Hill, St- Hill street in the, in the late seventies. So there's all these shows Can that I just say that I'm mad that I'm going through his IMDb and there's not a single credit for 10 speed and Brown shoe. <laughs> You know what I noticed too? Uh, did he not have a hand in um, Beverly Hills Bunts? I, th- I find it impossible that he didn't. But 
from what I can tell, no. And I remember Beverly Hills Buns because that's him and Lando Malari from fucking Babylon 5. Brad, you're probably too young to remember this, but I can distinctly remember it. Mm -hmm. It's a Thanksgiving episode of Hill Street Blues playing. Yeah. And Bunce gets his fucking finger cut off. Uh Uh-huh. On NBC, Thanksgiving night, 10.55 p.m. I mean, it's like Sharky's machine. Oh, yeah. That was Botchkow. Botch, exactly. Botchko, no matter what genre he was working in, no matter, I mean, what, d- d- you, you kind of immediately sort of go to like the cop genre, but yeah. even beyond the cop genre, where, whether we're talking about law dramas or melodramas, this was a guy who made a career out of pushing the envelope for what could be shown and what could be dealt with on network television. And Hill Street Blues was a series that really was kind of my intro to TV drama. Because I remember that whole lineup. It's the earliest lineup that I I remember being there from... The beginning of must-see TV. Exactly. Being there from from 7 p.m. to uh, to 10. And I remember my parents, uh, it was Cosby Show, Family Ties, Cheers, Night Court, and then... Let's put it this way. All you need to know about how good a writer Botchkow was, he wrote episodes of Columbo. Yeah, he did. And mm-hmm. motherfuckers need... I love the fact that Columbo is now easily accessible. Yeah. Because it has just a reputation of just grumpy guy, doesn't seem too bright. But when you go back and rewatch those, they'll those are Matrushka doll dramas. Yeah. They literally... And for the record, <laughs> let's just call a spade a spade. Dick Wolf owes them a little bit of money. Because <laughs> uh, combine Columbo with Sherlock Holmes, mm-hmm. and you get Lieutenant Gorin. Yeah. Where you already know who the killer is, but the fun is watching your protagonist figure There's- it out. There's a lot of shows that owe, uh, or there's a, there's a lot of TV creators that owe Botchko some money. Oh yeah, what what he did, especially starting with Hill Street Blues, was really turn all of these genres on their head. Like yeah. a lot, he of would the put com- comedy in drama and drama and comedy. And Hooperman's coming up next. He did, and we were so, we were very used to a certain kind of procedural. Um, where it's, you know, it's the case of the week and everything. And our lead is, is typically maybe some larger than life figure. Maybe he has a quirk. Maybe the actor has a, a particular way of playing the part. You know, it, it, it's all about like, kind of like the particular gravitas of an actor right. or the machismo of your, of your lead, like, you know, your Rockford files or things like that. And what Bochco did and what he continued to do throughout his career, especially starting with something like Hill Street Blues, was to really show what really wasn't explored a lot on TV at the time, especially in that genre. The lifestyle minutia of existence. Exactly. Exactly. Like, yeah, you had your cases on there. You had your crimes that were solved. But Even though we got to admit, um, Haim and Warren... Did have a miraculous recovery after that pilot. <laughs> <laughs> I had to bring it up. Well, I guess this was the day, the days when like pilots were also TV movies. Exactly. Was, in case was that you, also- in case you didn't get picked up, you had to have some si- some sort of resolution. Played by Charles Haim from Nightbreed and Michael yeah. Warren from Hill Street Blues. Um, mm. <laughs> um they get. They get Murphyed and Robocopped at the end yeah. of that episode, but they mm-hmm. are they become recurring characters. And you know what? Rinko is mildly racist. Uh huh. And Michael Warren's character is kind of like I'm from the hood. I'm used to this. I'm gonna deal with it. But every now and then, I'm gonna do a Richard Pryor and say, "Take that with you." And the bromance between those two. Between that that series, also the 
platonic relationship between um Betty what was her name? Betty Russell? I forget. Betty, Betty Rubble, you're right. Betty R- <laughs> Did you say Betty Rubble? <laughs> <laughs> I only rolled one for this tonight, Brad, and I haven't smoked it yet. <laughs> I mean, this this is a show and a world that is about lives, that is yeah. about these characters as people, it, about the gritty details of the job and was, also living this, this life in general. It was French Connection serialized. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And no, absolutely. And when, and when you and I brought that up for a reason because it's hard to explain in the age of reality TV, in the age of docudrama, how revolutionary Hill Street Blues was with yeah. the handheld aesthetic. It felt mm-hmm. like real life. Yeah. It was grungy. It was dirty. Mm-hmm. Everything wasn't perfect. The people look like people. Look at the cast of Hill Street Blues. That is not the cast of Friends. No. Yeah, and it's not the cast of just your kind of by the numbers procedural. Your uh uh you know, your uh your NCISs, your CSIs, right. uh, those those shows from those creators where and they everything. have quirky characters but they all yeah. look sexy. Yeah, they all are. They they fit an archetype, you know. I'll they, they... merge her Helgenberger. I'll tell you that right. By the way, <laughs> as dope as Hill Street Blues is, we're glossing over Gemini Man, aka Riding with Death. You're gonna have to talk more about that one. There's a there's there was a few on there where uh, you you'll probably have a better. I'll put it like this: Gemini Man came out during that time when people watching TV that were cult geeks. Just wanted to see special effects, and good God, the shit we would sit through to see them. Mm-hmm. Let's be honest. We love man. We love manimal. Yeah. However, Auto man. We have to also admit, manimal. Every episode or so would make us really, really edge a bit more than we wanted to. Waiting for those special effects. Sure. <laughs> and then we go, please, new one. Please, new one. And then one time I'm with my cousin, and and we're not really paying attention to the TV because it's been Panther every week for like five weeks. And then suddenly Eric McCracken's snake pops up, and we're like, ah! But he, uh, he was a production member of the MSG3K episode, Riding with Death. Yeah. Which, of course, gave us, you know, woohoo! Ah, woohoo! Ooh, easy rider! Mm hmm. And I just love the fact that when you gotta get your oats, this is the shit you gotta do. It's like John Taturo in Rounders. Sometimes you gotta be a grinder. <laughs> yeah. You gotta be a grinder before you can make a LA law, which is where I wanna drift to now. Oh, you don't wanna talk about uh, uh, Bay City Blues first? Oh, other than to say, Bay City Blues, they spent more money on the advertising than it ever made. <laughs> this show, Bay City Blues, uh, 1983 to 1984. It was a Stephen Bochco show about a minor league baseball team. And you've that used was this theme, haven't you? I have. That was the theme for uh, when me and Jared had that that Brad and Jared gotcha. series over over on my site, and it was this eight episode. It only lasted eight episodes, and Dennis Franz started on there before he went over onto Hill Street Blues. One Botchko Blues show to the other. It's yeah. like, hey, yeah. it's got it's Wait. also got blues in the time. And France is going to come up on more shows than you might realize before we're yeah. done. Bay, Bay, maybe that's what the network was like. It's like, well, Bay City Blues also has blues in the title. Uh, and that's the name <laughs> of the baseball team. So, all right, yeah, maybe this will do well. The show was essentially Bull Durham before yeah. Bull Durham. Yeah, like it, it, it was just guys recapturing youth. And it was that time in the 80s, too, when like that kind of melodrama was kind of... Oh, come Starting. on. He saw the big chill. Yeah, yeah. It was one of those. <laughs> I mean, like... I, I saw that from the minute I saw that. Because you got to remember, I went to U of M. I'm familiar with Kasdan. I've actually got a couple of scholarships from him. <laughs> right. 
so yeah, like that era of like forgotten early eighties yeah. melodrama. Like for every big chill, there's like ten windy cities. Exactly. You know? And Bay City Blues is in there with the windy cities. And it's you know, my dad played a lot of ball when I was a kid. Right. Uh so Bay City Blues was certainly a show that I can be nostalgic watching the show because kind of, of just, what's connected to it you because of yeah because of my my dad didn't play minor league baseball but he he played he he was on a softball team every week so like i uh i can when i watch that show i I can kind of think back to those days, you know, my dad coming I, I home. I mean, I totally get that. I watched Cheers because my mom was a raging drunk. Just, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> then I watched Oz because my cousin's in prison. <laughs> one, one real, one more real quick thing about uh, Bay City Blues. Remember, uh, remember how it how it added it added animation to the MTM logo at yes, the end of it. Yes. Also, if you were a fan of those produced shows, you always watched an MTM show to see how they subverted the logo. The best every what, what, show did it best, and Saint Elsewhere, of course, had the best one ever. Yeah, Saint Saint <laughs> Elsewhere, easily, easily the the flatlining version. Yes, they totally the cat on the season finale. Oh my after god! Tommy I, Westfall told you how the world works. <laughs> Bay City did it where it was uh, the cat was he had a mitt and like caught a caught a baseball and so which one uh, you want to do L.A. Law next? Yeah, I feel it's necessary because it's hard to explain. Wait, actually, it's easy to explain. Mm-hmm. There's when we're recording this. There's a little movie called Infinity War coming out right now. It's yeah. had what I have to refer to as a little bit of hype. When L.A. Law came out, it is hard to explain the hype machine that was behind it. It oh, was dude, like, yeah. this was Botchkal taking us in a whole new direction, and you know what? He fucking did. He did for the he did for the genre of law shows what he did for cop shows with he Hill Street totally Blues. He did. You cared about these people. He brought Perseus from fucking Clash of the Titans. Yeah. A chick from the Partridge family. And some gringo with an <laughs> earring. And, <laughs> and then made, future Bobby Simone. <laughs> and he made these motherfuckers blow up. To let's put it this way, L.A. Law blew up the same way Twin Peaks blew up on a mainstream level. Mm -hmm. It was water cooler talk, and it was water cooler talk for about six years. That's oh, yeah, what I'm dude. talking about. It had longevity because they kept flipping up the cast. He had an ensemble cast. Amanda Donahoe shows up with one of my favorite characters ever. And for all the geeks in the audience, let's get it out the way right now. Stephen Boschkow pushed Dr. Pulaski down an elevator shaft to satisfy all your dreams. It was a show you could be hooked on just from the opening titles of it. Because it kind of starts out with like some of those angles where for a second you think you might be watching Miami Vice. Exactly. <laughs> it, 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 it had a gloss to it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, during the Mi Miami Vice era, that was important because if you didn't have the gloss, then we said, "Oh, you're the insiders." Well, it shows you they're this sort of like kind of glamorous, very wealthy lifestyle that these lawyers are living, and then it sort it certainly gets into the gr the gritty details of their lives. Yeah, like, Pascal, at the end of the day, was really good at showing people in power tend to also have hollow lifestyles. Yeah, yeah, and what LA law did that was, that was done so well, again, like with Hill street blues, LA law was not a show where you're just turning it on for background because, you know, every week they're solving a new case, you know, it, it, it's not that kind of law show where it's just like, all right, this is just background noise because I'm over at grandma's. Right. It's not, you know, to, to again, 
again. And as much to- as I love uh, uh, Law and Order and all its variations, with the exception of Criminal Intent, you can use them as background noise and still get the gist. You can, which is why I'm, which is why I never really grew up with those. Your Law and Orders, your NCIS. Yeah, I will and say your- Criminal Intent. No. You were paid yeah. for paying attention to details, but that show was an experiment. But that's uh-huh. a conversation for another day. <laughs> I guess I was, I always felt spoiled by shows like, like Botchko shows and also shows like Miami Vice as well. Like, I felt like I was just spoiled by growing up on a lot of those shows. You grew up with that... production values and character arcs. Yeah. <laughs> I mean,. The one thing that Bosco and um, I would say man, but let's be honest, after season two, he was thinking about Crime Story. Um, right. So frankly, believe it or not, Dick Wolf, they understood that you needed self-contained stories with an A, B, C resolution. Bosco, more than almost anybody else then, understood the character beats could evolve from episode to episode, but you exactly. had to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So in the world of syndication, you could show them out of sequence, and it wouldn't be that jarring. Well, Botchko knew that people are tuning into these for the characters, for these characters' stories. for. Exactly, for what th- what's happening in their lives right now and how the events of the episodes are affecting their lives and affecting, you know, their their home life, their family life and everything. It, it gets into the, the vices that they have, the, you know, the demons that they're going through and everything. He knew that that's why you're watching it. It, yeah. it It's it, it which again, like going back to like I. You know, I always felt very spoiled by growing up on a lot of shows like that, which made me really not care that much for just your standard cookie cutter procedural. I was about to say, and, and the fact that the word procedural is a term that makes people think of a very specific type of show tells you that you're probably right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's the show you instantly go to in your head when you think procedural? I think NCIS, I ain't never seen none of them. Yeah. I mean, you're, I got to be exactly honest. Right. I, 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 I mean, I grew up with Vice. I grew up with Hill Street Blues. I grew up with L.A. Law. I grew up with Max Headroom. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up with Crime Story. I grew up with The Wire. I mean. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, you're need, a thousand percent right. I need to know that when I watch episode one, if I watch episode 27, if I've missed the rest I will feel something has happened. Mm-hmm. And those... Because to me, the procedurals are just like Star Trek Voyager. They uh-huh. have a magic reset button at the end. Yeah. No matter what has happened to you in that episode, next episode, you'll be exactly the way you were from episode one. And I don't uh-huh. get that. And Botchkow was one of the greatest understanders of no sprinkle that shit make sure their episodes are self-contained but have character arcs so you see an evolution as you keep watching and you see an embroidery (laughs) dennis franz has not one but two character arcs with two different characters on hill street blues (laughs) exactly (laughs) also Um, he was a lot like star trek i like you as this i'm gonna cast you as that yeah um and to jump into nypd blue you know that from just the pilot of nypd exactly. blue. with, with what happened scandalous yeah with with what happens to uh andy sipowitz at the end of that yeah. episode and it's, uh, what it's almost ha- a call back to fucking hill street blues yeah no absolutely and, and uh nypd blue I remember uh, this was in season one of NYPD Blue, uh, and I I started watching it in in season one. Now, keep in mind, I grew up in a household where, as a little kid, you know, I'm watching Miami Vice and I'm watching Hill Street with with my parents. You know, my, my, my parents were really cool to let me watch most things. Yeah, especially if they let you watch the pilot of NYPD Blue. 
Yeah, it, it's it, got more than you were expecting. Well, when it the first uh one of the first things I remember with uh with NYPD Blue was uh I was upstairs at uh, my mom's place at the time. I was getting ready to jump in the shower and the TV was on. Now keep in mind we over at my mom's place we had uh Showtime and I think HBO. Uh, oh my god, you're about to tell me you saw Sherry Stringfield's ass and you thought Showtime was on the TV instead of fucking ABC. You're close. You're real <laughs> you're you're really close. It wasn't Sherry Stringfield, it was Gail O'Grady. It was uh By the way, this... she's chunkier and funkier, so I I approve. <laughs> it was the scene where she takes her top off in front of Meta Boy. Yes, and she has 90% under boot. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And like that's on. And I'm oh god. Uh probably twelve, maybe. Um, and I, I look over and there again, there's the ABC logo on it's the screen. Right. But I'm like, wait, this huh? <laughs> Granted, it was a good thing I was jumping into the shower right afterwards. I'm about to say, because you know, you could use the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was like, so that was, that was so controversial at the time. Um, to the, remember when they had to stop doing that after the Janet Jackson thing? Oh yeah. But I, what I love most about NYPD Blue, and I think they have butchered this episode since then, mm -hmm. but I had drifted away from the show, but I had heard that there had been some advertising about a major event about Bobby Simone and um, what's her name? Uh, Kim chasing, Delaney chasing Judge Amy. Yeah, yeah, uh, Kim Kim Delaney. Or yeah. wait, 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 uh, Kim Delaney or Amy Brenneman? Brenneman. Okay. And I'm watching it, and they're fucking. Yeah, they're like really fucking, like Jimmy Smith's ass crack everywhere, and then he goes, oh. Oh, and she looks at him and says, we just made a baby. I remember that. Yeah. And I am convinced because I've been trying to track that down the way I saw it. <laughs> and I'm convinced they have trimmed it down because I was shocked and amazed this was on broadcast TV. Dude, any time I've ever caught NYPD Blue in syndication, it's always trimmed down. Like, you remember the great gag where it showed uh, Dennis Franz's ass? Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and it subverted you. You thought you were going to see Sharon Lawrence's ass, but yeah, no, you get Dennis Franz ass, and then she reaches around and he's got stitches on his dick. <laughs> and he goes, "I could get used to this." Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you this whole the whole series was like you know you, you had the you had your your years akin to like you know james bond years you know you had your caruso years your simone right. years your ricky schroeder right. your mark august don't sleep on ricky schroeder that motherfucker came correct dude i oh i'll get into that in a second <laughs> but like the whole overarching thing really is it's Andy Sipowitz's story. I mean, yeah, when you, it really is. If you look at it, it's his story. Yeah, it, 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 it very much is. Now, certainly the partners he had from Kelly to Bobby Simone right. to they, they all certainly had their huge arcs as well. And really great storylines to go along with them. Certainly like uh, the, the, every single one of them were great in their own way. Oh, yeah. But Dennis Franz, I mean, in playing Andy Sipowitz, you look at a guy who is deeply flawed as fuck. Like, even outside of just the alcohol. But he keeps trying to yeah. be better. Yeah. And then you get to the end of the series where, you know, he's taking care of his son. He's remarried. Like, you just see just right. an arc of this guy's life. You see an arc of a guy who says, I'm fucked up. Let me try to fix this. And dude, like, and, and they threw everything in there to get 
to you know every temptation to get this guy back to drinking again like oh, yeah. losing his son losing his son the only thing that was missing was him in black and white walking down an alley and there were like neon signs saying drink here gin and rummy blah 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 like like in some goddamn uh spoof but Bo- botchko was not afraid to experiment and we'll certainly de- we'll definitely oh yeah i think that that's probably second. where we have to go next well uh real quick like he wasn't do you remember that weird episode of nypd blue where like sipowitz kept seeing the ghost of his son um that, that one i don't but i think the space that episode should take is the episode where they had vanessa del rio stars herself <laughs> to talk real quick about the Ricky Schroeder years, which was only like two or three seasons, yeah. like on on NYPD Blue. But you have to admit it was uh, intense. Yeah. Oh hell yeah! Like because I remember when it was announced that uh, I think they went intense because it was Ricky Schroeder. I think, dude, I think so. Like, I when it was a net, like that was that was controversial when it was announced that Ricky Schroeder was going to be replacing Jimmy Smith's because everyone loved Jimmy Smith's and loved Bobby Simone. Um, it it seems like usually whenever you ask somebody, even though we got what ten episodes of uh, Jigsaw's torture porn of <laughs> Bobby Simone, <laughs> I'm sorry. I felt at one point I was being manipulated. Uh-huh. I, I felt like we were going, God damn it, you have to give him the Emmy. Oh, yeah, yeah. I oh. was like, oh my God, I love this character. Why are you making me go through this? This is really <laughs> uncomfortable now. I love Bobby Simone, and they made this much. I mean, yes, he ended up noble and amazing, but oh my God. God, I got problems in my real life. I may my bills may not be paid this week. Why you gotta make me deal with this Bobby Simone shit? <laughs> usually, whenever you ask, like it seems like the answer is usually when you ask who your favorite Sipowitz partner is. It seems like more often than not, it's it's Bobby Simone. Oh, yeah. Um, but what was so surprising about Rick Schroeder was. People's expectations being so low because he was known mainly right. for silver spoons. Exactly, like he he was known as the silver spoons kid, and you know we we've seen this happen time and time and time again. Oh yeah, where, uh, an actor gets announced to play a role. Jackie Earl Haley. <coughs> it gets yeah, it gets heavily criticized, and then you see it, and something great comes out of it. Uh, with Rick Schroeder, uh, really from. The second he's introduced on the show, you're like, this is not the kid from Silver Spoons exactly. anymore. They they straight up turn him into a stalker on that show. He came in ragged edges on his feet of clay that he mm-hmm. put up on the coffee table. Yeah. He, he was like, I am flawed. Fuck you. Yeah. Uh, we're at this point now where... We know what our second syndication deal is going to be. See, Bosco <laughs> was also real smart about this shit, too. After you yeah. get past the first hundred, you can get a separate deal for the second hundred. If mm. you can be that kind of show. But, I mean, not everybody can be Bonanza or Law and <laughs> Order. Yeah. But once they realized that, they were like, you know what? We have now streamlined the production process because I love the fact that I know, Brad, you're exactly the kind of person like me who sees this. You see the exact transition from when it goes to the location footage in New York to the back lots of L.A. Oh, Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I came to accept that and said, you know what? I admire sometimes their audacity. Yeah. But when they brought Schroeder on there, I felt like they were like, you know what? We started this show as a edgy show. Mm -hmm. And now you've gotten used to how edgy we are. Mm -hmm. Let us remind you what the fuck edgy is. And that was right at the beginning of A&E... And Bravo starting to have original series and stuff. So the 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 envelope was opening and Bosco saw it. 
Dude, remember Shorter creeping outside Kim Delaney's apartment? Yeah. (laughs) And you're supposed to say, that's my protagonist next week. I heard, and maybe you could tell me if this was true or not. I I heard that that's why Schroeder left, was because of how dark they turned his character. from what I heard was behind the scenes, budget cuts were getting to the point where you weren't even going to get fucking location sequences in New York anymore. And if you had to shoot everything in L.A., then it becomes any other TV show just with dirty language and nudity. I mean, Gosselaar was good. Uh, he oh, was. Yeah. So I mean, and I have to admit, he impressed me. Yeah, he he did me too. He was he was certainly really serviceable in the role. Like a lot of the really kind of dark stuff he went through, you, you kind of saw with some other characters too. Because there's a part where there's a whole storyline where he totally goes off the wagon and starts drinking and everything. I mean, it was interesting to to see that dynamic with him and Sipowitz where Sipowitz, you know, has to say to him like, Hey, I've been there before. I, I know what this is doing to you and everything. So it was, it was interesting to see that dynamic right. for sure. The most interesting character for me in the Gosler years was in the final season when they bring Curry Graham in there as the new Lieutenant who was like secretly gay. As much as I want to go to cop rock because there's such a dichotomy from this one, two season punch. Can we even remotely explain to this modern audience what happened when the world was exposed to Daniel Benzali? Oh, murder one in murder one. That was, that was like something that you would expect to be specifically designed for binge watching yes it was binge watching before it existed this was a serialized show if you miss an episode you didn't know what the fuck was going on yeah it was like the better version of 24 but 24 is the one that got much more popular murder one was it was what it was one single case per season and yes. it was it only it only lasted two seasons but it was it was one where like i mean hell we've been talking this entire time about botchko certainly turning these genres on right. their heads making them about these characters about their lives murder one did that and ran with it not only that murder one in my opinion is the perfect synthesis of the character arc nature of a soap opera yeah. Combined with the complete serialization of something as far back as a Flash Gordon or the Shadow mm-hmm. or Buck Rogers. You literally had to see every episode for the show to make sense. And if you committed to that first season, you got an amazing show. And I'm convinced. That a young David Simon, while he was working at the uh, Baltimore Tribune, saw that show and Mm -hmm. said, I'm going to tell a story like that one day. And then five seasons later, you got a little show called The Wire. Yeah. That's that's exactly what Murder One was. It was wildly ahead of its time. It was a show... It was a show that if it was around, like, I'm, I'm glad it was around when it was because of how influential the right. show it was. It made you expect more from shows that hinted at that, but then you always felt them pull back and push that reset button. It was one where if had it come out 10 years later, 10 or more years later, exactly. we would, there would be well more than two seasons of murder one (laughs) kind of like how i say about deep space nine now uh cop rock come on man (laughs) all right let's let's go ahead and jump into bro let's go ahead and jump into i will not deny i had such high hopes i was like you know what uh i can't fault him for anyone could pull it off it was gonna be botchko uh-huh and to be honest, I sometimes prefer flawed 
but interesting over unflawed and pedantic. You're right, because Cop Rock is... It is an insanely watchable, what is it, 12, 13 episodes? Yeah, I mean, you kind of sit there going, I'm not sure what I might see next. It oddly still feels like Bochco because if you take the musical numbers out of it. Oh my it, God, the non musical parts are fucking dark as shit. Yeah. I think he was using the music to distract the audience from how dark he wanted to go on this show. It is a. It is still a gritty cop show. It's they an are incredibly st- gritty cop show. It's it's gritty as fuck. I mean, this is an era where even you know, Tequila and Benetti has an episode where they're chasing a serial rapist. Yeah. Um, I, like if I recall, there were abortions. There was racism. There was there was dark shit on fucking um. There were cops that had like addictions and shit. Yeah. I've told people they should honestly give Cop Rock a chance. It's like, I I know, sure, maybe you're not into musicals. Maybe you could certainly make the argument that, like, these are two genres that really are having a tough time meshing. Oh, yeah. But but the best part is, keep in mind that when you would see, like, one character do a rap thing about their rape daughter, it would fade out. And then you see a commercial for Jason Alexander talking about the, uh, what was it, the uh, McDLT? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just imagine that Stephen Boschka had enough power (laughs) that that sort of thing could happen. Then you'd see like a Kodak commercial for the Kodak disc, just because I had to say that. He has enough power to the fact that not only does Randy Newman do the, the do the theme, he's there on yes, camera. Yes, he's actually writing songs. Yeah, he's there on camera. The motherfucker that the motherfucker that wrote the songs that changed the '90s generations with Toy Story. <laughs> and it 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 would even have like throwbacks to other. Uh, Bochco show like namely Hill Street Blues everyone knows the line from Hill Street Blues let's be careful out there they referenced that in Cop Rock to the point to where they turn it into a song <laughs> uh you'll even see because this was before NYPD Blues so you'll even see James McDaniel is in Cop Rock who would later go on to be in uh NYPD Blue ah that's right uh well, you know, he was I mean Bosco was infamous for like, if you're good, I'll find a new character for you. Oh, even Milch would do that all the time too. Uh, there's uh, two seasons of Deadwood where Garrett Dillahunt is is the villain on two seasons as two different characters. But Brad, <laughs> can you admit, even at 12 years old, them beats they use for the rap sections of Cop Rock were kind of whack as fuck. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I man, appreciated I was... the lyricism, but I'm a hip hop producer. I've done beats for people you guys motherfucking know. I just realized that was not the life for me. And considering the fact that two of the people that I worked with got killed because of hip hop, I think I made the right choice. Um, but well, the, oh the, my the, god, the it, it, it was Mike. Post doing hip hop beats, and I love Mike Post. This motherfucker did the soundtrack. He did the theme song to Stingray. God damn it! Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yes, I said Stingray. God damn it! I <laughs> uh, mean, you weren't. Uh, uh, he the he's guilty song isn't a timeless classic. Mike Post. I'm sorry, Mike Post, mate. Chung chung. His his legacy is assured just from that. Mm-hmm. But Mike Post also did the Doogie Howser thing. Another Stephen Bochco show. Did you watch Doogie Howser? I watched it enough to get the gist of it, like basically most of the first season. And then I was like, you know what? I kind of see where it's going. I got other things I could be doing. I mean, it's certainly, again, it's a genre that Bochco is doing something different with. Extremely. Um, the fact that 
preternatural being alert. I hate to say it. I bet you Bosco's projecting a little there. Mm -hmm. I mean, given his body of work, clearly this motherfucker had a brain bubbling with activity all the time. Oh, yeah, if he gave us cop rock, yeah. So imagine being six or seven years old, and the best way you can express that is maybe drawing a picture to make your friends laugh or making a sculpture out of fucking uh, Play-Doh. I mean, dude was experimental. Like, whether we're talking about, you know, Doogie Howser to medical dramas like, like that show was, and cop rock the fact it's a gritty cop musical yeah. but also like public morals the yeah. spin the spin-off with john the secretary from nypd blue that was a sitcom yes <laughs> and it was a stephen boschkow sitcom yeah which is like imagine a reinhold ouija sitcom but standards and practices is asleep right now. Was Public Morals one that was canceled after one episode? I thought they got two. Okay. I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember. I just remember John left NYPD Blue, and then here's this Public Morals sitcom, and then John comes back. What cracks me up, though, is that Public Morals in a softer form already existed. Yeah. I called it the first season of the John Larroquette show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, dude. Totally. Before uh, I am before so, it was sanitized. I am so... Yeah, I am so glad that even though it's in its most rudimentary form, most people don't realize the first season of the John Larroquette show was shot in HD. After, after NYPD, really the only thing I got left about him is I remember that that final season of... NYPD Blue, when it was nearing the end, and uh, I was, my dad and I were huge NYPD Blue fans, I had moved out a, a, few, a few years before uh, NYPD ended, but I still consistently watched the show, and then when the finale came on, my dad and I got together so we could both watch the finale together, and during that final season, they they kept advertising, like, now that NYPD Blue is over, here's the next great cop show from Steven Bochco. And it was Blind Justice. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> with, uh, Ron, uh, with Ron Eldard. Yes. And I remember I kept seeing the trailer going, okay, I know Steven Bochco's name is on here, but this just looks like, I don't know, if, if he tr was trying his hand at something like Ironside like it it Bosco looks like I was paying as much attention to that show as Dick Wolf was paying attention to Law and Order Criminal Intent I know right like this this looked like okay this is this is just kind of a a gimmicky kind of this looks like a procedural yeah this looks like just something that I'm not gonna I'm like I can't I can't really see this last this sounds like and it didn't uh, this sounds like Bosco had a bad weekend at Vegas uh huh. <laughs> so uh, let me slap my name on this shit real quick. Those uh, I know exactly, thanks to my quicken, what the residuals will be. <laughs> yeah, I'll put my name on Blind Justice. Yeah, like because when I saw uh, the ads, I was like, I'm not watching that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, my, my standard of quality is is too high right now from like all of his best other shows, and even something like Cop Rock. You can love Cop Rock or you can hate it. Right. It's still, it's but still you at the still end have of the to day. Respect it. Yeah, it's still at the end of the day giving you something different. Um, I mean, you but, can hate Cop Rock, but the audacity of it—you still have to sit back in awe and say, "I can't even believe he thought this would work." <laughs> Blind Justice was like, why do I need to watch this when I can just, I don't know, watch Blind Fury with Rudger Hauer and get it over with in 90 minutes? <laughs> also, see a great Rudger Hauer performance. Yeah, oh yeah, dude, totally. And But yeah, that, that, that show came and went, and I... 
he created a few other shows after that. None of them I saw. Uh, he created Murder in the First, Raising the Bar, and a show called he Over. He created the- a, a a genre of TV that unfortunately outpaced him. Uh huh. It reached a point where there were now creators other than Bosco that were inspired by Bosco. That yeah. were inspire me, like when Ron Moore gets. Battlestar Galactica. Uh-huh. Or when um The Wire. Yeah, The Wire or Tom Fantana somehow amazingly gets what seven seasons of homicide? Yeah. I really hold Steven Botchkow in debt because without Botchkow, without him, there is mm. no way you get homicide. And yeah. Homicide may be in my top five. Yeah, oh, you're exactly right. Without, and even, even those little, like, in-between shows that maybe lasted a season right. or two. You saw experimentation and shit. I mean, yeah, I didn't, ca- I didn't care for the baseball show. But you know what? Some of those little asides when they were just talking which in most shows would be filler. Uh-huh. Were character beats that felt real. Yeah. Compared to... I always like to use SNL as my template, and God damn it. But yeah, I hate to say it, I don't want to leave on a bad note, so let's just say... Botchkow... The Chaff... Is more than understandable because of the fucking amount of wheat. Uh huh. This motherfucker has one of the best ratios out there. When you think about the amount of time he spent on television Mm -hmm. and the output he put, and I'm even willing to forgive that incredibly horrible LA riots episode of LA Law. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, my God. That that. shit is comical. One of the characters ends up like Rain Man at the end of the episode. Are you my mommy? Mm-hmm. Because he got beat up by the Reginald Den- Denny proxies. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's totally what that scene was. You didn't mm-hmm. fool me, Bosco. It says a lot about a guy's influence and a guy's career that, yes, his his hits, his his... Hill Street Blues, NYPD Blue, L.A. Law, uh, Doogie Howser, how influential and how they really changed these genres on television. It really says a lot about a guy that his not only do his hits do that, but also the ones that only maybe lasted a season or two, like all the stuff that came after Murder One or even Brooklyn South. Uh <laughs> It it says a lot about a guy and his career that even even the short lived ones still have a voice that is is heard by a small amount of people. Oh, I got a but, word for but you. The there. Right, but the right amount of people. I got a word for you there. Yeah. Resonance. Yeah. Uh-huh. Boscow had resonance. Mm-hmm. And what I love most about Bosco is the fact that the same way you can look at other artists who wanted to change how we perceive our entertainment Mm -hmm. that were flashy, that were over the top, that were always, I am an artist. No. Boscow chose the journeyman route. Yeah. He forced um I just realized how important a statement I'm about to say he forced a form of media to change to what he wanted to do yeah <laughs> think about that guys this motherfucker changed TV mm-hmm. the TV we have now would not exist without Stephen Bojko he pushed every boundary that could be pushed. And I'm we, trying to do and we are much the richer for it. 
I'm trying to do the same thing on my end. I want I want there to be more cat detective shows. <laughs> <laughs> I am on Geek Juice, and just like Vigo Mortensen in The Prophecy, when you wonder what might be under your bed, that's me. <laughs> that's why we'll wait till prison for, for our Oz retrospective. Um. <laughs> oh, by the way, if we're going to do stir crazy, man, um, no offense, bro, but you're going to hold the yarn. Okay. <laughs> I've been practicing this for years. Uh, you can, you can subscribe to me at youtube.com slash the cinema snob. You can follow me on Twitter at the cinema snob or go to the cinema snob.com. I'm probably on other things too, but I guess those are the main three. So <laughs> we'll so talk what, to you so soon. So what he is implying is that on other places on the internet, Brad is a space herpy. Well, I mean, I did, I'm sure I got my herpes from space. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd I got, rather get them from a Crosby. I got the. I, <laughs> I guess I from the wrong. Here. I got the wrong blowjob when watching Jason X in the theater. <laughs> <laughs>